Ernest and those of you are in the UK, yeah. is it is of November the first November the first in Wednesday. So that means that it is not time for voting. Today we have DJ please. Hey, please. Hello everyone. I'm glad to see that there are 200% more people here than I anticipated. This is great. So they asked me a while ago uh, if I would be willing to give a webinar to the, the GoGN uh, and, and talk about my experience, particularly about my, my educational experience in graduate school. And as I got thinking about that, I realized that really it was it was uh, it was the, the time I did my PhD that um, that changed the course of my life and and is where I was introduced to open educational resources and is the reason that I think that any of you are interested at all in hearing my story and I am I am just going to tell my story um, if that's okay <laughs> um, whether it's interesting or not will be determined but. Um, I felt like it, it, it was valuable for me to look back and see how the how I got to where I am and I, and and what that might mean. So um, I will say that if you have questions uh, during you know while I'm while I'm speaking at you, uh, feel free to type a text or a, a chat and then let me know, and I'll stop and we can address things as we go. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, we'll plow right in. What I realized uh, as I was thinking about what to say today is, is that the the reason that I'm here uh, and doing what I'm doing has everything to do with the people that um, I interacted with as I moved through my educational experience, particu particularly the people who served as my advisors and mentors directly um, responsible, not just my teachers, though I, there were a lot of teachers and a lot of people involved. It really, um, there were really some key individuals, and I'm obviously not going to mention all of them, but I thought it might be worthwhile to, to talk about a few of them um, and help you understand how I really have had an unexpected journey. I did not start anywhere near where I am now, and maybe that's a, a, a case for you as well, uh, and so maybe you can take heart that <laughs> even though you may not know what you want to be when you grow up. Um, that you can still have a good time and and have an impact and 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 have a, a, a have success and satisfaction in what you're doing and that's that's how I've been feeling about this as well. So I will say that my journey uh, began re really when I started thinking seriously about what I wanted to do in life um, began in high school. I'm not going to go all the way back and talk all about high school, but there was one person that had a, a an outsized influence and I could not find a picture of him. Unfortunately, he retired in 2005. And his name was Stuart Frankham. He was my uh, biology teacher, and he taught the advanced biology class. And and um, the thing that the the reason he influenced my life was because he he did not see me or anybody else in the class that we were in for what we were, but more for what we would become. He always referred to us as as sophomores in college <laughs> instead of instead of juniors in high school. And made us believe that we were we were um, able to succeed. It was a very rigorous class, and it was really hard. But I I I gained my first passion edu educationally from Stuart Frankham, and that led to 
me deciding what to even major in in college and what to study, uh, which was biology. Now, I did that because I was good at it. I'll, I'll be honest to say that I, I didn't know how passionate I was about it. But I did know that I was I could succeed in that area, and so I chose it because I thought mm, I can succeed. And so I went off to college, and in college, uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to work in a lab. And so I was doing biology, particularly microbiology and molecular biology, and I was able to join a lab of, an, of a new faculty member, somebody who had just arrived on campus. Um, he was only three to four years into his into his professional career as a as a tenure track faculty member with Byron Adams, and Byron is one of my best friends. Uh, I'm still very close with him. Uh, he is a, um, a biologist. He studies evolution. He studies ecology. Um, he, he spends two months a year in Antarctica. He's kind of a hot shot. I like this picture. He doesn't normally look like that. He's usually in a, in a much less interesting outfit. <laughs> but he, um, he taught me a lot of things. And Two things that he taught me have stuck with me and have literally been guideposts in my life. Uh, one thing that he taught me was that I should never let school get in the way of my education. And the other thing he taught me was that I should follow my bliss. And that is a phrase that I had never heard before, honestly, even though my last name is Bliss. I had never heard that phrase, and I did not know what he meant by it. I learned later what he meant by it, but I didn't know at the time. And I'll be honest, I did not follow that piece of advice. I didn't follow my bliss. I, I didn't follow uh, my passion. I followed what I thought was perhaps the path of least resistance when it came to getting a degree. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Between the time that, so this is my undergraduate time, uh, and, and when I went off to graduate school um, for the first time, <laughs> um, I went and did an internship in Washington, D.C., and I actually worked for the Army, and I studied the malaria vaccine back before there was, there was money to study the malaria vaccine, and all of the, all of the uh, investigators and researchers that I worked with had infected themselves with malaria because they had no money for human trials. It was a really, really rough time. Half of my time I, I spent downstairs in a teaching lab teaching inner city kids about uh, biology and science. And the person who, who brought me out there, her name was Marjorie Anderson. And this is the best picture I could find of Marjorie. But, but she, she was the person who first taught me to be culturally sensitive, <laughs> which is an important part of my story. Uh, the situation I was in was I, I had never been around a lot of the people that I was around in that situation who had come from backgrounds that I didn't fully understand. And Marjorie was patient and kind and, and, and trusted me to lead. She was, she was somebody who, who believed that I could teach and that I could lead. And she helped me, she helped me find my passion. My passion, I realized during my time with Marjorie and out in, out in Washington, DC, was actually for education. And, and not just education in terms of wanting to teach, but in terms of doing educational research. And she let me do educational research. In fact, together, she and I and a bunch of other people, um, many of whom had nothing to do with this, but that's sometimes how the government works, um, ended up writing a paper. This was my first paper. I wrote this as an undergraduate. It's in the, the Science Teacher uh, Journal. And it was about these organisms that I was studying and how I had used them to uh, help students understand science and inquiry. And it, you know, it's been a fairly successful paper. It's not my highest cited, uh, so like only three citations, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> it is something that was really meaningful to me to go through that experience and, and not to believe that I could do research, but that I could actually get people to pay attention to it a little bit. And so this was my first foray into what I call my passion or my bliss. It was doing educational research in a classroom and then sharing that out. So um, as I'm finishing up my undergraduate work, I'm looking for what to do next. And I didn't, I didn't explore a lot of options. And I honestly was in such a silo that I had no idea, literally no idea, 
that there was a field of education researchers. I, I didn't know that. And none of my advisors didn't know it. Byron didn't know it and Marjorie didn't know it. And this is just the, the reality, right? They knew that there was science and they knew that some people did. Basically, the model was that anybody they knew doing education research were basically lapsed professors <laughs> of science or biology, people who'd gotten tenure and then they could study whatever they wanted and nobody could hurt them. Or, or, or stop them. And that was the model. And I was shooting for that. At that point, I had found what I wanted. I was gonna, I was gonna bear with it. I was gonna get through my PhD. I was gonna skip a master's degree entirely so I could get done more quickly so that I could get tenure, so that I could study what I wanted to study. So I was willing to subject myself to 10 years of, of doing what I didn't really love, though I felt like I could probably do it, so that I could get to what I wanted. So I, so I basically, uh, went off to graduate school, and I and I started working with Tom Powers. He looks a little bit like Sasquatch here, and I think he'd be okay with that. He likes being out in the woods. Um, but Tom Powers is uh, was my first graduate advisor, and interestingly enough, he was also Byron Adams' graduate advisor. So it's sort of an incestuous tree academically here, where I I went to basically my academic grandfather to be uh, my my PhD advisor, and Tom was happy to take me. He trusted. Um, that I could I could uh, do the work and that I was passionate enough about what he studied. Uh, it turns out I wasn't passionate enough about what he studied. He uh, he loved um, these these microorganisms that he studied uh, to a fault. I think so a little bit. Um, and no, nah, that's not true. Not to a fault, but he he was very passionate and he could spend 10 to 15 hours a day on a microscope, just alone in a dark room, looking at nematodes and describing them and drawing them. And he was a morphologist. He was getting into other things uh, technologically uh, using DNA, but he was a traditional, uh, a traditional, you know, lab scientist, microbiologist, and and he he wanted me to follow in his path, and he expected me to to do that, and I and I I didn't love that, and he didn't fully understand what I meant when I said I liked education. He always what I loved about Tom was that he always he always tried. He would always reach out to me and say, this is educational and this is educational and try, tried to find, he tried to make my passion, which he recognized but couldn't understand, fit what we were doing. And to his everlasting credit, he was willing to allow me to switch advisors, even though he had been the one that had invested in me coming um, to the University of Nebraska where he was. And so I was able to switch over and work with a, a newer faculty member named Chad Brassel. And Chad is really the person who, who helped me um, figure out that what I was doing was not my passion. It was not the thing that I loved. And he encouraged me to figure it out. He didn't know either, but he was, he was wise enough to sit back and say, well, surely there have to be people who do this. <laughs> There's, there must be a group out there who studies education and makes this their life. And TJ, I can see that that's what you love. And he even went with me to, to biology conference, teaching conferences. I used to be a member of the National Association of Biology Teachers. And I was interacting with all of these lapsed professors who had moved on in their careers to study uh, biology education instead of just biology. And he would join me and travel with me to these conferences and, 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 and try and help me figure things out. And it was him who said to me, four, three years into my PhD, after I'd finished all my coursework, he said, you know, you don't have to get a PhD in biology. You, you could go get a PhD. If you want a PhD, if you want to become a professor, if you want to study this, then why don't you go and get a degree in that, whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you can figure it out. And he was the one who said, I will help you figure that out. And so Chad really encouraged me to do that. And, and, we, and we made this decision. It was a huge decision to decide. To, to stop what I was doing, I was able to I was able to get out of this all a uh, master's degree, and I'm not going to talk about my my master's thesis, but it did require me to spend nine hours a day on a microscope for an entire semester. And so this is where somebody may, maybe some of you know uh, Hugh McGuire. Hugh's in the OER community. Well, I didn't know Hugh, but Hugh had done something that made it possible for me to get through my master's degree and and to and to trudge through this time when I had when I was not passionate about what I was doing, Hugh had developed a, a, a resource called LibriVox, which is a public domain 
a community-driven audiobook website. I don't know if any of you know LibriVox, but it was his first big project. And it's still up there, and it's still successful. And because of Hugh, I was able to make it through those microscope days because I listened to the entirety of The Count of Monte Cristo and Don Quixote and several other works of literature <laughs> while, while, I, while I looked at nematodes and drew them on paper and, and did this study. So um, when I finally met Hugh, it was, it was this celebrity moment for me. <laughs> it was one of my greatest honors to be able to help him move on to his next thing because <clears throat> he made it possible for me to get through what was a really challenging time for me. But I did it. I, I studied hard. I got my master's thesis done. Uh, for sake of uh, time, we're not going to talk about that, but I studied switchgrass, which was a potential biofuel at the time uh, they were looking at in, in addition to corn. And I studied these below ground communities uh, and it was, uh, it was okay. In the words of Tom Powers, after I defended my, my thesis, he said, well, that was better than I thought it was going to be. So I took that as a compliment and also as a as confirmation that I was I needed to move on and do something else. So anyway, I started looking around for what I wanted to do, and 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 uh, I had I had been at Brigham Young University for my undergraduate degree. That's where Byron Adams was, and uh, it's it had always been taught to me that it's academic suicide to to go back to your home institution. You should have variety in your in your institution. I don't know if that's actually true, but it was sort of the mentality that I had that. I shouldn't have all of my degrees from the same university. And so I, I had no intention whatsoever of going back to the university where I had gotten my, my undergraduate degree. And, but I, I, had a, um, I, have a, I still have a wonderful wife who did not have that in her mind. And, and she found a program that um, she thought maybe could, could fit my interest. <clears throat> I remember reading the description of the program. The title of the program was Educational Inquiry, Measurement, and Evaluation. When I read that, I had no idea what any of those words meant. And then I read the description of the program, and I'll be honest, I understood 20% of what was written about this program because I had no background in educational research, in, in particularly in me measurement and psychometrics, which this program ended up being. But I decided it was worth a shot <laughs> because because um, I knew I didn't know any better, and it was a fully funded program, and it was an opportunity to go, get closer to home. All the reasons, and so I sent an email off to the head of that program. His name was Richard Sudweeks, and I basically described to him some things I was thinking about when I was in graduate school, which really related to uh, teacher evaluation and how students rate their professors, and how I felt like that was a really broken system, and how I was kind of upset that you know the the, in tenure and promotion policies, they don't take into account, you know, teaching as, as heavily as they should. And we don't have good measures of how teachers actually teach. And it turns out that that is exactly the sort of thing that this program was about. It was about qu big questions in education and how you can use measurement techniques to understand them. And so when I emailed Dr. Subix about this, he wrote back immediately and said, this is exactly the sort of thing you should definitely apply for this program. And eventually I made it into the program. And it, and it was a big change for me. <laughs> I came in to a program, a PhD program, having had no previous undergraduate or, or graduate level work in the area that I was in, like none. And it did turn out that I had some common things. I had had some statistics, of course, and I had some things where I was able to, to get some of my uh, coursework counted for into this program, but it meant that I had a lot of work to do. And my first class in this program was on uh, project management and grant writing with this young man. And this was my first experience, obviously, with OER. And on the first day of class, you know, David, David can't help himself but talk about OER. And I remember sitting in this first class and David trying to convince us that OER was, a, was an important thing that we should all pay attention to. And um, I didn't really believe him. <laughs> this is, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand what he was talking about, and I didn't know uh, why, uh, why we were spending time talking about this in a, in a grant writing and project management course. Uh, Helen wants to know what year this was. This was 2010. 
This was seven years ago when I took that first class with David Wiley. So um, I also remember in that first class and in the one of the first first or second days of that class, um, David launched into private philanthropy and talking about particularly the Hewlett Foundation. So my first interaction with with David Wiley was about open educational resources and the Hewlett Foundation. Obviously, you know, there's there's something to say about his success in that class uh, in terms of, you know, getting me to help <laughs> further the cause of OER. But that I didn't think much about it after that. In that class, he asked us to think about, uh, you know, what big project we wanted to do and help us start thinking about our dissertation uh, topics. And I wanted to go and study uh, I wanted to go and study um, educational extension efforts in Malawi. That's, I remember that that was what I proposed that I was going to go to Malawi and I was going to uh, to help. Uh, I was I was stuck on this on biology and I wanted to do nematode stuff and there was a lot of work going on there. And somebody asked uh, they asked why Malawi. I think it was because one of the one of my colleagues uh, in my program was from Malawi. And so I could, I, he knew a lot about the extension programs there. And so, you know, I was just formulating my question. The hardest part of my entire dissertation was figuring out my question. There's nothing harder. If you can get your question honed in, then after that, it's all just work. <laughs> it can be hard work, but, but once you have your question, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a game changer. And so this first question, was something that David helped me start thinking about and had nothing to do with OER, had really nothing to do with um, what I ended up eventually doing. So long story short, I go through my programming, I take the first year of courses, and then somewhere in my second year, in early to, to fall of, I think it's fall 2011, I'm walking across campus and I come around the corner and I run into David Wiley and John Hilton. And things had not been going so well with the faculty that I was researching with. I was doing science education stuff, and things were kind of falling apart there for me. And so I was I was looking around for what I might do next. And John and David stopped and said, "Oh, hey, TJ, we we wanted to ask you a question. Will you come and help us uh, do some research on OER on our team? We have we we would love to have your help." And I thought about it. I wasn't not immediately enthusiastic about that because um, I didn't quite know what they were doing or whether it was something that would be interesting to me. So I asked if I could, you know, learn some more and I set up a meeting and I went in and met with them and eventually, um, eventually agreed to, to join that team. Somewhat to the chagrin of Richard Sudweeks. Not that Richard didn't like David, but, but Richard also understood that what David was doing was not the, folk, not the core focus of the program that I had come to do, which was around assessment and measurement and psychometrics. And, and which I had taken a liking to and was doing really, really well at. And so he was hopeful that I would stay in that path. And, and he saw my move to go and work with David Wiley and John Hilton as, as, a, as a bit risky for continuing on in the program that I was in. But I, I was able to work that out with him by committing to him, because I, I agreed. I didn't know for sure what it would do. But I committed that I would actually not allow David Wiley to become the chair of my committee to avoid having too much of a focus on this, this area that we none of us really understood about open educational resources. And so I kept Dr. Sudwick, Richard Sudwick, on my as my committee chair, which was probably the best decision that I ever made. But now I didn't know that at the time. Of course, David was on my committee, and John was on my committee, and a few other people, Lane Fisher, that some of you may know, was on my committee, and some other folks that I needed external um, expertise on. So I went to my first prospectus defense. And I was interested in, in a very deep psychometric question, diagnostic modeling, how to, how to understand how students think about math. And I had, I had a series of three or four sub-research questions. And I went into my committee, and I presented this thing. And Lane Fisher, I should have a picture of Lane up here. After I presented my prospectus, Lane packed up and said, TJ, if you do that dissertation, it's going to kill you. And it's going, to, you're going to be here for seven years. <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, you're, you have one, too many questions, and two, your questions are too broad, and, and you're never going to finish this. It's, a, it's an amazing perspective. He said, you did an amazing job of talking about what you want to do. You're never going to be able to finish this. I encourage you to, to pare it down. 
And then, you know, that really rocked me because I was ready to launch into this. I was going to do this. I was going to, I had my, everything lined up. I, I read an entire textbook about this stuff. I was ready to go. And that's when I really had to think about, like, what do I care about? I had moved along further in my time with David and John, and I was, I was starting to believe in this OER cause. I was starting to become converted. And, uh, but I still recognized that I didn't want to do a dissertation about OER, that I wanted to stay true to uh, what I had come there to do, and, and I was interested in measurement. And so I wanted to do something around that. And so I did um, maintain Richard as my committee. I changed my committee a little bit and added some new people as I changed my question, which I'll talk about in a minute what my questions were. Um, but maintaining Richard as my chair really meant that I could stay true to this area and also incorporate, I could bring in other people that I was becoming, I was finding my passion. So um, I, I kept people like David and John and Lane on my committee to help me with that. And then uh, I, you know, I, I was able to get to a, dis, a dissertation question that the committee agreed on and it was fairly straightforward and narrow and doable. And I was able to complete the research on that. And the day before I, um, well, I, I should say something else as well. Um, and there are many, many more people that I didn't, I didn't put on here as I think about this that are really important in the story. But David invited me to go to the Open Education Conference in Vancouver in 2012. And so I went to that conference. It was my first introduction to the world of OER and this amazing community. And as I'm at that conference, um, I had already agreed that I would stay on and do a postdoc with David Wiley. David had gotten a grant from the Gates Foundation. He had money. And he said, TJ, you stay here. You can do some research. You can publish a bunch of papers. And then you'll be the, you know, you can go and do, you know, amazing work in OER and research on OER. I was going to do that. I had agreed to him. I committed to that. I went to the Open Education Conference. And while I'm there, I had dinner with, a, with one Cable Green, who, by the way, I, when I first met, had had not been as interested in talking to me. <laughs> That's a longer story. Uh, but at this point, Cable was willing to go and have dinner with me. And as we're having dinner, um, he mentioned something to me that, that also changed the course of my life. He said, um, you know, Tom Caswell at the Open Course Library and the, the State Board in Washington uh, is, had left his position there. And it was one of the biggest, you know, scaled up OER projects going on at the time with the Open Course Library. And so I, uh, I was intrigued by that. And I thought, well, I'm almost done with my dissertation. I, am, I was on the job market. I was looking for things. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity to go down the OER path. And I can go and, and, and I can take the, it's the old position that Cable had. Tom was in Cable's old position. And so Cable was basically saying, TJ, you'd be perfect for this. You should, you should, you should apply for that job and you should do this. And, and at that point, I had to make a decision. Do I pursue the job hunt? Do I go looking for a job, or do I stay with what I knew I had in my hand, which was that postdoc opportunity? And after long consultation, but not very long, because I'm sort of impetuous and I don't take a long time to make decisions like this, um, I actually decided that I wanted to start looking for a job. And I did want to take the postdoc. Uh, and so I worked it out with David. and. Um, that was when Jared Robinson, who some of you might recognize some of his research, he did, he did some of, I think, some of the highest quality research to date on OER. Jared was able to step in and take that postdoc. And I'll be honest, Jared did a billion times better than I would have done in that postdoc. And I'm so glad that he was able to do that. He was he's just a lot smarter than me and, uh, and a lot more careful than I am when it comes to research. He had all these these qualities and attributes that I didn't have, plus being highly interested in these in these areas. And so I went off and pursued the job market. I started looking for other jobs. I, I applied for the job at, in Washington, and I started looking around. And, and one day, my, my father-in-law was in Hawaii, and he saw a piece of paper posted to a light pole, like on a, on a wooden light pole, that was advertising for a director of assessment for the State Department of Education in Hawaii. And he called his daughter, my wife, and said, hey, TJ should apply for this job. He knew just enough about what I was doing to recognize that it might be a job that would be relevant to my, my education. And, and that caused my wife to think, oh, I wonder if there's a similar job in Idaho, where I'm from. And she was always trying to find a way to get back to Idaho. And so she looked for that. Uh, and it turns out that there was. Right at that time, they had been searching for the same kind of job um, in Idaho. 
and the pay was quite a bit better and the cost of living was quite a bit lower. And so she threw it to me and I said, absolutely not. I knew the director of assessment for the state of Utah and I knew that that was not a job that I wanted. It was not for me. She said, okay, well, I still want to try because I want to go to Boise and, <laughs> and, and I think you should apply for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll write the application and, and you can, then you can edit it and send it in and I'll make it very low, low, uh, effort for you. And I said, fine, whatever, do it. I, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I, I need in case other things don't come through, but I really, really thought that the Washington thing was going to come through. I, I just had, I just had high hopes that this other job would come through. And then she, um, she wrote that application for me. And then I, I wordsmithed it a little bit and then I sent it in and turns out that Idaho at that time was extremely desperate for a director of assessment. They had gone through many candidates and they were willing to take somebody who hadn't even finished their dissertation yet and had never had a job, had never managed anybody. And uh, I felt like I got very lucky, but I went up and I, I uh, interviewed for this job and uh, accepted it literally nine hours before I defended my dissertation. I didn't tell David and I confessed that I lied to him when he asked me how the job interview went. Um, I didn't lie, I just withheld information. So I told a falsehood and he wasn't happy about that. But I really wanted to announce at my dissertation defense that I had already gotten a job and that it started next week. And so I didn't want to have a lot of edits, which the committee agreed <laughs> was okay. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what happened. And so I defended my dissertation on a Friday and by the next Wednesday was in, in Boise um, leading a team of eight people and in a job I had gotten in way over my head had no idea what I was doing, but quickly figured out what I, you know, some of the things that I needed to do. And it was a steep learning curve, but it was a really, really beneficial one. And it's really what led me eventually to Hewlett. So the opportunity, you know, the, having had that, that PhD was one of the big things that allowed me to get that job in Idaho. They wouldn't have hired me if I didn't have a PhD because I had no experience. So they were really relying on my expertise, not my experience. And, um, it turns out that, that that job was a pretty good fit for me that was super stressful and it was a political job working for an elected official and he decided not to run for re-election which meant my job was at, at high risk and right about that time uh vic vuchik had left the hewlett foundation and he was the oer program officer and i had met people during my time in that first job um, who were sort of connected in this world and knew that i had done OER work. So I brought David Wiley into Idaho, but I was doing OER work off the side of my desk like most of us do. <laughs> it was not my full-time job. OER was just a passion at this point. And I wasn't able to spend a lot of time on it, but enough that people knew that I was an advocate and that I had done things in this world. And so when this job came up and they started looking, um, I, had, I was in a position that was high enough level that I was on the radar and there were people in this in the network who knew you know knew my name and they they pushed it on to Hewlett and they were willing to give me you know let me apply and I did and and then um, somehow I pulled the wool over Barbara's eyes and she was willing to hire me into that role um, despite again having no experience whatsoever in in uh, in philanthropy but but she hired me she told me once that one of the reasons she hired me is because she knew that I was passionate about OER I had taken the time to get to know people. I knew 75% of the organizations that Hewlett funded. Um, I, had, I had spent time at open education conferences. I had spent time working on different things. And so, I, and mostly I was passionate about this. And so she, she believed that I could come in and make a difference in that role. And I really appreciate her, her trust. Um, so that's my, that's my story, right? And now, and now I'm, at the, I'm, not, I'm at Wiki Education because I'm still following my passion which is also morphed into taking care of my family. And, and I don't feel like I need to be in a position like at Hewlett to be happy. Although it was one of the best jobs I probably ever have. Um, I'm finding that I can find passion in a lot of areas, but I'm sticking true to this, this area of education. I'm sticking true to this area of, of um, open educational resources and access to knowledge and, and, and this wonderful movement and thing that we're doing. So, so, that's what I learned most important through my graduate, through all of my education from high school on up, is that uh, that I need to follow my bliss. And so that's the advice I would give to you. I would say follow your bliss. Figure out what that is. And, and I don't know that 
you'll be able to figure that out on your own. I wasn't able to figure that out on my own. It required a lot of people to help me figure that out. So that's my story. Um, I did I did want to show you my dissertation, but I can if there's only there's only five of you on here. So if you don't actually want to see my dissertation, we can we can stop there and just chat about things. Um, or I can walk you briefly through what I ended up actually doing in my dissertation, which I, I as I, I actually read it. On the day Stephen Hawking released his dissertation in the open, I thought, well, I'll read mine because uh, I haven't read it since I did it. And it's also openly licensed, so we have that in common, Stephen and I. Um, but Stephen's, I guess, dissertation was much better than mine, turns out. Still, uh, I, I think it's valuable, and I love um, – uh, no, I, I did, as I went through it, I realized that I had, I had left a lot of open questions, which may be of interest to some of you if you're working on this or somebody you know. So that might be valuable. Okay. So I, I'm hearing a couple of people saying, go ahead. So my dissertation, um, what I ended up wanting to study was I wanted to look at how students thought about the quality of their textbooks. So there is an OER element to my dissertation, though it's not about OER particularly. And the OER element is that when you have, a, say, an open textbook as a professor or a faculty member, it means you, you can do something with that textbook that you can't do with a commercial textbook or a fully copyrighted textbook. And that is that you can actually improve it. You can make changes to it. You can tweak it from year to year. You can, you can ed edit it and adapt it. That's one of the principles of OER. And recognizing that, I thought, well, then maybe it would be good. I, I thought, how are faculty going to know how to edit and what to edit and how to improve their, their textbook? One way is they have their own expertise, and that's largely what they uh, what they use, and they can they make that own, their own decision based on what they how they want to teach and how they want, how they think students should want to learn. But I thought you know the student voice in this is actually really important as well, and there's probably a lot of information that students could provide to faculty in making these decisions on how to improve their 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 textbooks, and it's particularly relevant when the textbook is open, because if it's not open, then you know. It, it, you can make a dichotomous decision, do I choose a different textbook or not? But you can't make the finer decisions about how to improve it. And so that was my question. What, uh, well, I'll get to that. Uh, I'm giving you, these are actually my dissertation notes. So I'm not going to walk through all of them, but this is my dissertation defense. And um, David, as I was defending my dissertation early stages, David said, you know, don't just start with, with open, don't just start with textbooks, but like, why do we care? And so we care about education because blue education is a universal human right and that education can help people improve their lives and improve other people's lives. So, and there's a, there's a role for educational materials to play in education uh, in that it's a, it's a, you know, Hugh McGuire calling back on him said that, that the textbook is the operating system of society, meaning it's, it's a, it's a, it's a type of educational technology that has been around for a long time and probably isn't going anywhere. Um, in the sense that we put information in a scope and a sequence, and we walk through material in a in a comprehensive and, and co coherent way, um, it might change forms, but that that process of going from the beginning to the end of a of a, of a discrete subject area is important. And so I, I actually do believe that. I don't think I don't think textbooks are really going to go anywhere. They might change form, but the idea of a textbook, of of a of a structure like that. And so then, how do we evaluate our textbooks becomes important. And there's a lot of work that goes on with textbook evaluation, but very little around digital textbooks, because digital textbooks are pretty new, and nothing around the student perspective, quite honestly. That's what I found. So that was my lit review. Um, the purpose of my dissertation was to, I wanted to develop and empirically validate a model of what digital textbook quality is from the perspective of college students. There's a lot to unpack here. Can you see the pencil? Running around? Okay, so the word quality was the first difficult thing to unpack. What does quality even mean? Basically, this was a study to understand what the word quality means from the perspective of college students. I'm trying to define the, the term quality or high quality for digital textbooks specifically from the perspective of college students. And there's two, there's two uh, approaches to that, a qualitative one and a, a quantitative one. And that's and the quantitative piece was the was drawing on my my measurement um, expertise and really fit well with my dissertation. So these are my two questions. One, I wanted to know what the most desirable characteristics of a high quality digital textbook are from the perspective of all students. 
And then I wanted to know how these characteristics translate into a quantitative model that could then be used to systematically evaluate that quality. So the end goal was actually basically a survey or an instrument, but not just a concocted out of thin air survey, but a, but a, a qualitative and empirically validated instrument that you could give to students and have them answer questions about their textbook that would give you real information that you could trust. So this was, this was my process. This is my methodology. So I did a bunch of student surveys and interviews, and I did a lit literature review. And that was all compiled into a qualitative data set, which I, let's see, I think I have that's yeah, here. And then the qualitative data set was subjected to a technique called thematic analysis, which honestly is simply reading all of the stuff and pulling out emergent themes. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Sometimes you can have things that you think are going to happen and you try and confirm them. You look for them in the data. This was not that. This was, here's the data, what comes out of it? What, what are the commonalities? And there are approaches and methodologies for doing this. And then there's a, so that revealed um, a number of target themes of, of things that came out of the qualitative data that students had mentioned, that the literature had mentioned. And, and I had to label them somehow, so I gave them all names. Um, navigation, access, technical performance, interaction, relevance, presentation, impact, and diversity. Interestingly enough, the only one that students didn't mention was diversity. All the other ones came out of the student data. And, and some of these were confirmed in the literature as well. The diversity came up in the literature a couple times. And so I included it because I also thought it was important. And I figured my own take on this was also important. Then I did some mental modeling. So this was like a, to generate out of, out of what I had heard from the qualitative data, what, what might this look like in a, in a diagram, like if you, if you diagram it out. And this is where it gets pretty technical and wonky. But, um, and I don't know how many of you have seen uh, factor models, but this is what one looks like. I think pretty cool. Um, but basically, you see the big ovals here. These are all of the themes. And this was a mental model for me, is, is you have these eight themes. And then to make a mental model, you can start writing questions that you think get information about these themes based on the qualitative data that I have. And so I started writing what we call items. But they're just they're just survey questions. They're just in this case they were multiple choice questions. And so I wrote a series of questions that I felt would um, adequately model these, give information about each of these themes. And then I had another model where I thought, well, maybe these these higher themes are actually related to each other. Like say these four themes are more related to each other than these four themes. And so maybe there's some higher themes that, that capture those, like this is all about content and this is all about technology, these four. And that's, that's the mental modeling that I went through um, based on the information that I had. So that, so that was where I developed, I developed the items um, and then an initial questionnaire based on those themes. And then I gave that initial questionnaire to several hundred students. And so I could get data about how they responded to that questionnaire. I, I was involved in the Project Kaleidoscope project, which maybe some of you have heard of. It was one of David Wiley's projects and, and Kim Thanos, who is with, at Lumen Learning. This was their first project together. And it led eventually to Lumen Learning. But I was involved in that Project Kaleidoscope. And so there were a lot of students at eight colleges across the United States and um, who were using digital textbooks. All of them were using open digital textbooks. So there is a limitation there. But I basically gave the questionnaire to the students and that gave me data, which allowed me to modify the model and evaluate the model, sorry, evaluate the model and then modify it and then you know, go through a few rounds of that to get to a, a, a model that fit the data. And so this is a bunch of, of information about how well this model, this particular model fits uh, that data. And it's actually a pretty good fit. And I'm gonna walk through it. You know, I, I did that, you see 10 modifications, is quite a few modifications. And then I looked at higher order model and evaluated it. And then ultimately I chose a model. So which, which bear is best? That's a, a reference to the office in Dwight Schrute, in case you don't know. <laughs> but I really wanted to know which model is the best model so that I could 
produce a, an instrument. And what, what it led to was actually throwing out a number of the items and rearranging some of the some of the relationships between these these themes and choosing this higher order model. This was the model that um, I eventually chose. So some conclusions. Um, I was able to establish some criteria for evaluating digital textbooks. I was able to get the college student perspective on that evaluation. Um, oh, sorry, this is contributions of the study. These are the things that the study gives to the world. Um, there is a, now a factor model and a measurement instrument that allows you to evaluate text, digital textbooks from the student perspective. And there's also something useful, I think, in the approach that I took to developing the instrument. Interestingly enough, not many people develop their, their measurement instruments using a mixed methods approach, which I strongly subscribe to. I think we ought to use it. A lot of times they just craft it out of their mind and then, and then go and test it. So let's see. Some recommendations for um, how to use the model and how to use the instrument and then how to use the research or what what sorry what might be some future research questions um so the model itself like that path diagram with all those things and all the all the fact all the numbers and data that are in there actually could be useful to to people who are developing educational materials they could take into account those those factors and and see how they're weighted and how important they are they could be important for people who are evaluating textbooks, including faculty members, but I think less, less so faculty members, and then developers and adopters of OER. Um, and of course, for you know, people interested in studying this sort of stuff. For the instrument itself, I think that's the most useful piece, practically useful piece, and that would be that could be useful for people who are doing development of the, of the content and then and faculty who are using it in their in their classrooms. Uh, there are a number of limitations in the study. You can read about them, but the recommendations for further research may be perhaps the most interesting thing. Um, one of the big limitations was the sample size. There were only 300, 350 students, which for a qualitative study is a huge number, but for a quantitative study, particularly of this size, is very, very small. Usually you want over 1,000 respondents to be able to adequately evaluate a model. I was able to adequately evaluate this model. Um, I mean, it tells you if you can't do it, it won't let you run the numbers. And it will give you really bad data. And I was able to get quite high data, which I felt very lucky to get. Um, there are also, we need to validate these studies across different you know, types of classes and not just the community college classes that were involved in Project Kaleidoscope. And then there's some wonky stuff around um, factor invariance, which honestly, I cannot even tell you what that is right now. And the funny thing about reading my dissertation is I only understood about 80% of it. Although I promise you, I wrote the entire thing. When I went back to read it, I was like, how in the world did I get all of these words out of my brain? Which told me something, that when you're in the middle of this, when you're close to it, um, you can do hard things. Even things that when you look back on it three or four years later, you're like, ah, how did I, how did I ever accomplish that? The link to my dissertation is here. Somebody's asking for it. It's just on my website. I think it links out to like ProQuest or wherever it is. Um, but anyway, that that was uh, that was my experience, and thankfully uh, it it, uh, it all worked out. And and uh, I don't know who's used it or what they what they wanted to do with it yet. I did have um, maybe I didn't get it to you. I did have some of the questions. Um, I put some of the questions in here from the instrument, but you can look at them on the um, on the dissertation itself. All right, so now people have questions. What is the connection between the dissertation and your current role at Wiki Education? Absolutely nothing. I mean, between the dis this dissertation research project, what I did, there is there is no connection whatsoever to what I do right now at Wiki Education. But that doesn't mean that the skills that I learned aren't valuable. So actually, we do a, a, an evaluation, a, a survey of faculty and students at Wiki Education, and I realized that I'm able to weigh in in much more detail and, and give a lot more um, help to the people on our staff who are developing those those surveys um, so they avoid asking you know difficult like poor questions and I mean, we don't get into like psychometrics and measurement modeling and all that of course but i am able to give input there so i think there is some definitely some benefit but really the biggest connection for me between my dissertation taken as a whole and what i do now is that anytime that i feel like i can't do this or this is too hard I can think back to this time when I did something incredibly challenging and succeeded, right? That's something that I think drives me often and is 
perhaps the strongest connection between my dissertation and graduate school and all of that experience. I, I, I don't know that for, for me and for a lot of people that getting a dissertation, getting a PhD and doing your dissertation is necessarily about the content of the dissertation. It's a lot of times the biggest benefit is the experience and the not and the and the not giving up. I I I I equate it to I'm a big bicyclist, I cycle and I and I like to climb mountains. And when you're climbing a mountain, you you don't climb the whole thing in your mind. You if you start thinking about the top of the mountain when you're at the bottom of the mountain, you're almost guaranteed to fail because it's just too far away. It's just too tall. But if you can look up ahead and see some marker, whether it's a road sign or a tree or something that's standing there stationary and tell yourself, I can make it to that and then make it to that point, then you can look up and find the next thing. And it's these small goals. It doesn't mean getting to that getting to that road sign isn't extremely challenging and your heart rate isn't above 190. And it means it is hard. But once you get there, you've accomplished it. And there's a level of satisfaction that that I get out of that. And I found that to be true in my dissertation. I mean, I, I had a failed prospectus. It was awful. I mean, it was okay, but it was really, you know, going to be going to really throw me off my trajectory in life. And I'm really grateful to Lane Fisher, who often reminds me and mostly my wife that he saved my life and my marriage. So and it's true. So having committee members who are willing to see the longer game and recognize that you're not really there to answer a question, you're really there to to accomplish something really big because then you can go on and and know you can do that when things get really hard in in real life. And and I understand probably many people, um, maybe many of you here are on uh, are probably working in real life already and also trying to do the studying, which is doubly hard. You're carrying a whole bunch of weight up that mountain. Um, but it will benefit you, I think, even now to recognize that. Looks like Leo's typing a question. Oh, and Jenny, or maybe just a comment. So that's my story. I'm really glad I could tell it. Thank you. Oh, Jenny is defending proposal tomorrow. <laughs> the whole the whole dissertation or or like a prospectus? Is it like at what stage? Is this the go ahead to do the study or is it the is it the actual dissertation defense? Oh, plus the comp well, okay. Yeah, and 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 so as you see, Jenny says she understands about 80% of what she's presenting. I actually resonate with that. I, I didn't understand everything that I was presenting. Some, there's, a, there's a lot of faith that sometimes is needed in, in these things and, and recognizing that you are asking a question and you don't know everything and you shouldn't be expected to know everything. It might be Leo's asking if it's like upgrade or probation. Yeah, and every program is different. Like I didn't have a, I didn't have a comprehensive exam, thank goodness. I think those are, are extremely challenging. Um, but uh, in some programs, yeah, you get to a certain point where you finish a certain amount of coursework, um, and then you you have to go before your basically basically I I mean if you if you have a strong committee a committee that you trust, these are gates of protection. <laughs> these are these are moments where where your committee can step in and say like like Lane did to me, that is probably not the way you want to go, and it's not because I. He disagreed. He thought it was bad, or he thought that the question was unimportant, or the series of questions. It was that he was recognizing that he wanted me to succeed, and so finding those people on your committee who can speak to that voice is, I think, really important. Obviously, you want a chair who can do that, but um, that's something that I learned as well. And congrats, yeah, congrats to Jenny on this. It's going to be exciting. And you'll do and you'll do just fine even if you come out like i did with like yeah you can't do that one <laughs> you find something else you'll find you'll find that thing you'll find you'll find the thing that you can do that um that you can complete in a reasonable time so it's like a it's a weird pep talk because i'm like it's silent it's just me in my office giving somebody a pep talk it's just <laughs> writing back to me okay so it looks like that we're like one minute before time 
it's been great. Um, I love the, um, the, the, the story. And I also think that your research is awesome and it has like, you know, real validity and real use uh, um, today. Like, it, I mean, I love this. If we had more time, we could go on talking about it because I love this combination of uh, in the methodology, the quantitative and the qualitative, which I think it's, um, it's, it's what, what I love really. But, um, but anyway, it's been, I think it's been great. Um, you know, it's. It, I find it a very inspiring story, and and um, I know we haven't had like a great, you know, many many um, participants, but I know that there'll be a lot of people catching the recording, and I think if this is if this is a recording of worth catching. Um, so unless anyone else has has, has any questions, um, I say. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you, TJ, for sharing all this with us because it, it's been great. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's been super. And uh, so, again, thank you, everybody. And good luck, Jenny. Um, you know, I'll, the recording will be available in the next, in the next little while, I think, when I, when I manage to upload it to to um, our YouTube channel and um, anyone, well, do you know how it, how it goes? Anyone who's got a, who's got any comments, any problems, um, just let let me know and um, um, and I will see you. The, the next webinar is going to be like the, again the first Wednesday in December and it's going to be Rory McGrail who's going to be with us finally. So again, thank you very much uh, uh, to TJ for being here. Uh, for being a great supporter of GoGN and um, I'm so happy that, that this has happened, that this webinar has gone ahead um, and I thank you all for, for coming. So thanks and um, I'll see you next month.